Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And today we're sitting down with one of my favorite artists in the world. And I say that not just because he's basically my boss, uh, but it's Mr. Caleb Wissenbeck uh, of CK Studios, many time award winning painter. How you doing, buddy? Pretty good. How you doing? Uh, I am fantastic. It's good to be talking to you. Uh, Caleb and I were just working on and discussing a very big project that we've been working on. And to be honest, Caleb has done a lot more hard work than me. And we're excited. We're going to share that with you today, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so it's going to be a really, really good show. I'm happy to have you here. So for those of you who don't know CK Studios, by the way, and Caleb, obviously, uh, myself and Sam and Justin uh, and now Dev uh, all teach with CK, along with obviously Caleb and Kat themselves all around the country and in, very, and in the world. And uh, you can come take a class with us. You can find that link in the description all the time. But we're not here to just spruik CK. We'll talk about it a little, I promise. It's not just going to be this self-aggrandizement thing. Uh, we're really here because Caleb ha is such a, a wonderful artist, and I wanted to share his stuff and talk about his journey. So uh, let's just get right into it, man. I mean, did I did I miss anything? Is there anything else you want to say about yourself before no, we before we break I, into it? I, I, I'm blushing. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I, I I'm I'm glad to be here. I I love watching your stuff, and and even though you know that's why we brought you in, is we're so impressed with your abilities, your painting. Um, I, I love watching it. So uh, I'm just I'm glad to be here. Man. This is yeah, absolutely. See, Caleb doesn't know this, but Caleb had one of the first pieces that I ever took note of and said, I want to be able to paint like that. I don't think I've ever shared this story with you, but this is true. You were you were this is 100 percent. This isn't just me blowing smoke. This is 100 percent real because we're going to look at the piece. I didn't I didn't prompt you. I just hoped you would send me in the pictures that you sent me for us to look at the piece. But it was the first, I think it was the first crystal brush I ever entered. And it was your unit that I think we'll, we'll talk about when we get there. But you're, you're, you know what I'm talking about, the unit that she did there that year. And I saw that and it just, it blew, it blew me away. And I was like, this is what I want to paint like. And I went and I found the pictures, downloaded them. I was like, I need to learn this. And like, it was a goal. I kept pictures of it for, for like ever as my constant like measuring stick. So it was inspiration for, for years. So there you go. I, I have some great stories for that piece. Um, just the way it evolved and everything. So we'll save it for the piece, but awesome. right on, right on. All right. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Like we usually do. So what, you know, how long have you been doing miniature painting? How did you get into it? Where, where was your start? Did you come in through gaming? Did you come into the hobby? Where'd you pick um, this up first? You know, I, I, I came it's a long story it's it's an odd story back in middle school um 1987 88 ish um i had some friends that were playing dungeons and dragons i wasn't too into that but we played an offshoot role play game called twilight 2000 i know it yep. and and it was so much fun you know i i really enjoyed it and i was very much into the military at the time and, and modern armor and all that stuff so i i, I was really enjoying that and uh we're playing this role play game and my buddy Shiloh comes up and says, Hey, they have this new game that I want to check out. And it's called rogue trader. And I was like, man, rogue trader. What's that? And so he brought this book. And I mean, the book was like this thick, started leafing through it, started seeing the miniatures. And I thought, man, that is so cool. Um, so we started playing rogue trader, you know, right. Warhammer, Warhammer 40 K we started getting white dwarfs um checking out all the stuff there back then dragon dragon magazine i think it was called would have short stories warhammer stories you know there was i i still remember this day the the story about lehman russ and how he was raised by wolves and all of that stuff i mean old 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 school 40k lore um you know uh the the game space marine came out and then all right. of a sudden there, there was the heresy and um just phenomenal stuff and um the BT 101 box set came out. Of course, we bought that. Uh, got the compendium when the compendium came out, and we're introduced to Harlequins. And uh, the one model I fell in love with, and you guys can tell, uh, the Dreadnought came out at that time. Yeah, oh, yeah, sure. Lo love the Dreadnought. Love the Terminators. They are like by far my favorite models that have ever been. Um, so we played for a bit, about about two summers, and then. Um, you know, high school happened and sports, girls, 
et cetera, sure. et cetera. Standard, standard life stuff. I will say, by the way, you're the second person I've talked to in this series who's referenced that box set, that BT 101 box set as being like, a, 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 a you know, a landmark, right. Yeah. In, in the hobby, because it was such a massive, like, I, I think people who came into the hobby afterward don't understand just how big of a deal that was. Right. It was such a huge, huge box set. Like it's popular. Oh, yeah. It was Im immensely popular. They're go going from metal to posable, adjustable, convertible plastics was, um, forget it. It was so huge. It was so huge. Um, I mean, it got us into this, this game, this hobby. Um, so I, I was gone for quite a while. And then about 2009, I, I, I really got big into EverQuest and World of Warcraft. Sure. And I was playing that and playing that and playing that. Um, it became an addiction. I, I, I will admit it. I, I am terrible about gaming. Uh, I get addicted to gaming. The Xbox, the place, when the PlayStation 1 came, or, you know, the original PlayStation came out. And that was, the, I, I mean, I disappeared for like a year. <laughs> um, you so, don't have to apologize for your MMO love on this channel. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if I could, if I could. I, I, I don't want to know the number of like real days that I've lost to MMO since Ultima Online in 1998. It would it would be a shocking waste of my life. But yeah, I believe oh, me, I understand. And it was it was bad. So um had to quit playing it. Had to quit playing it. Um and man, I was so bored. I would get home and I just had nothing to do. You know, I was racing motocross at the time and keeping busy doing that stuff. But my evenings, you know, were just boring. I couldn't sit and watch TV. I'm kind of a, of a, I like doing things. I like kind of having projects, stuff like that. And uh, I'm also a big avid reader. I have been reading Warhammer novels for well before I, I started um, any, getting any of the miniatures. And I was reading the Soul Drinkers books and um, I just happened to walk by a local game store and I popped in. Just, you know, just to see what was up and sure, just what could, what could go wrong? Just pop right, in and check right. it out. Just pop in. And, um, they had a, they had a, you know, start talking to the store manager and he was showing me some models that he did and stuff like that. They had a, a Terminator librarian, uh, the metal one. And I picked that thing up, picked up some paints and said, you know, I'm just going to play around with it and just paint a model. So I was started painting a model. My uncle comes over. I have an uncle that's about two years younger than me. He played 40K back when we first started. Ah. He, he, act, he played the Harlequin, so he was in love with the Eldar and stuff. He came over, and he saw the model, and he's like, man, I remember that. Such good times, blah, 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 blah. You know, started talking. He says, man, I want to go down to the hobby store with you. Let's go down there this weekend. So we walked down to the hobby store, and uh, they have one copy left. It had been sitting for a long time. This is about the end of 2009. Uh, beginning of 2010 i want to say i'm guessing okay um, but it was a dark vengeance box set sure dark, yep. no, uh, dark vengeance no not dark vengeance the orcs and space marine one uh i'm sure it's somebody all, will put in the comments but yes black I rem black there you go yep. there's one that had the helicopters the little orc chopras um so we snagged that thing started playing a few games just just to have fun um he decided man orcs aren't his thing so he went and bought eldar went out he bought the first big purchase besides the box set and uh you know we started playing started playing a lot uh realized i had a knack for painting i really enjoyed the painting because it was so relaxing for me so i realized man i have a, i have a knack for for this painting thing and um started putting out really nice armies i was doing a whole soul drinker themed army i wrote a, a whole backstory for why they weren't mutated and etc cetera, etc cetera, you know because i didn't like the mutations of the soul drinker sure. um i love the storyline but for the space marines themselves i didn't like it too much so well you always got to make it your own right i mean that's right. that is part of the beauty of what we're doing here when we're painting miniatures is we are making something that's theoretically generic like everybody has the same access to the same sculpts but through the paint we get to make it our own so it's it is telling a story whether you're writing the words or putting the paint on right so yeah george yeah, yeah. so i you know i just got into that i was really enjoying it um started some tournament play started going to adepticon uh went to some of the first bay area opens um down at broadside bash we were just man we got into it tournament play we were we were 
playing a lot, but at the same time, I was really trying to paint all my armies to the highest standard. So I started knocking down some best ofs. You know, I'd go to some tournaments and win best of armies and everything like that. Um, had a local contest at the store. And it, it's a really funny story. Will, if you watch this, I'm going to tell it, dude. Um, had a local contest at the store. And it was a squad contest. You buy okay. a squad, you know, you know how the local stores, yep. sure. That, you buy a miniature there, you have a month to paint it or something like that. You enter into the competition. And uh, I, I bought a squad of Harlequins. I wanted to paint them up for my uncle, um, give him a present. So I, I did like my best I possibly could on these Harlequins. I did all the checkers and stripes and all that stuff. I really didn't know much about blending and color nuance and color shift and shading and any of that stuff. So they were a little, they were a little garish. Um, but they were painted nicely, fantastic freehand. I had a good skill for freehand. And um, I entered and I got second place. I, I lost to uh, to another painter there. He had done a squad of Dark Angel Terminators. And it ended up that the guy that I lost to was Will Hahn, a uh, multi-time Golden Demon winner. Found yep. out that there was a Golden Demon winner that lived in the town that I lived in. And the judge of the paint competition was another Golden Demon, Bryce Kokenauer. Um, so Bryce came over after the contest and said, man, you know, I really like your painting and I want to help you and start developing a little bit, show you some stuff. So I said, right on. So I, I got in there and painted with him and painted with him. And I kept working on the Holocaust squad and he talked me into going to games day. And he said, man, you should go to games day and, and enter this squad. So I did took it to games day and, uh, made first cut. So nice. But and so this would have been what, like 2011, 12, something no, like that. No, no, this is 2010. Okay, got it. It was really fast progression. I mean, gotcha. we no, started. Right on. We started playing, and within six or eight months, um, you know, I was already uh, well into competition painting. Uh, nice. Not, I, you I transitioned say, quickly. Right. I shouldn't say competition painting because I was still into tournaments, and you know, it took me a few years to stop tournaments. Um, but I, I went to Games Day. I got uh, first cut. Uh, super excited, met a whole bunch of painters there, met Chris Bohr, met Todd Swanson. I mean, the guys that I just so look up to, you know, even, even to this day, I look at their painting. And that was what I was first introduced to. I didn't know anything about this whole painting hobby up right. to that point. I didn't know who any of these guys were or anything. Got welcome in with open arms, uh, Wapple, um, Trevor, all those guys, you know, they were all there. They were all competing. Um, gosh, Jeffrey Bowden. I mean, it, the heyday back, you know, what, what I call the heyday of Golden Demons, that whole Team North America. Um, they were all there. Uh, really, you know, they just sat me down and I went and sat in the Golden Demon Lounge with them and we painted and, and they just showed me all the stuff and I was just blown away. Open the doors. That summer after Games Day, um, Matthew Fontaine taught a class in the uh, uh, Games Day, they weren't called Warhammer stores yet. They were called uh, the GW Games Workshop store. Right. Uh, he, he taught one in, in the Bay Area. Um, I want to say like Walnut Creek or someplace like that. Uh, Seth Amsden, of all people, was running oh, yeah. the store. Um, okay. So I, I, I went to that store. I got introduced to Seth Amsden. Um, this guy was there that was that was casting these bases and stuff. I'd never seen casted bases and all that stuff. Um, so uh, he handed out a whole bunch of bases in the class and everything. Uh, they ended up being called secret weapon bases. It was Justin McCoy. It was such a That's small, awesome. oh my God. Such a small world and such a small scene, you know, right there. Sure. Um, so we sat down, we took this class with Matthew and uh, the bug hit. I, I sat through a two day cl comprehensive class with Matthew Fontaine. And at that point it was just wide open from there. My goal after that was to win a golden demon um, pushed and pushed and pushed and finally got one with my uh, Raven guard captain. He, he finally hit and uh that was awesome uh you know it was i always Wait, entered here was that <sighs> Listen, i understand you know, this all blends together i, I want to say 2012 okay right on 2012 i want to say that was my first one um that was a big one you know i was super excited i'd won a i'd won a crystal brush the year before Gotcha. With, uh, with my Imperial Fist guy. Uh, learned a lot about pushing contrast and pushing the model and smoothing the model. And, um, you know, I, I really pushed and brought that Commissar, and, or I mean that, that Raven Guard. In fact, I'd taken him to uh, Crystal Brush that year and I lost to, to Wapple actually knocked me out of the top three. <laughs> I, I, um, 
I talked to the judges afterwards and they had told me about it. And they said, you know, before the online vote, I was third place and he knocked me out of third place. So I was really bummed about that. I was like, man, I thought I had it. I was so close. And uh, man, kind of bummed, walked into Golden Demon, kind of not expecting to do that well. And I always entered those those hard categories. I always liked uh, single figure sci-fi right. or fantasy. Um, you know, those were the one that I don't know why it was to me, but that was like, that's the category to win in. And I really pushed that. I did a lot of squads and I did a few uh, vehicles and stuff, but I always really concentrated on that single figure. And, um, yeah, at that game say, gosh, I can't even remember. I can't even remember if it was in Chicago or Baltimore, that's how bad my memory is. But, um, it finally hit and, and, uh, I got second to Kirill, super excited. You know, I was sitting there in the, the stand and they called my name and I was like, what the heck? And just, you know, nerves and everything. It was so much fun. Sure. Um, and then at that point, it was just, uh, just kept going from that point, man. I, I just took as many classes I could and just consumed painting. Eventually it took over gaming. Uh, I started going to Crystal Br- or uh, to Adepticon strictly to enter Crystal Brush. Right. Uh, I, I wasn't playing at that point at all. I, um, I was leaving the tournament armies at home. And uh, I never did beat Wapple at the army painting there. I wanted to beat him so bad. <laughs> <laughs> never did beat me. I had me and Wapple, you know, he, he always beat me. I was just like, dang, man, so close. But his use of color and light, I learned so much just from studying his stuff so I could beat him. That I just learned a ton about color and light off of just studying his work. Um, and then, yeah, at that point, uh, I got invited to teach. Um, uh, I started at Nova, I started at Depticon, I started at ReaperCon and stuff like that. And then it took off from there. Um, I was teaching, uh, painting, competing, going to every convention I could, competing. Um, took a few good uh, good awards. You know, I got a few best in shows. I got a few good ones. The, the one that always eluded me, and I'm excited it's back this year, but I never got a gold in Gold Demon. It, it was always silver. Right. You know? It's always the bridesmaid, never the bride on that. (laughs) So um, I'm excited, man. I'm going to really push the next couple years, um, you know, because I don't think Golden Demons are going away. And it's rekindled my – I haven't really competed in a couple years now. We've been so busy with teaching, but it's really rekindled my desire to compete again. So I got a few projects that I'm I'm working on that, uh, yeah, we're going to see. Just going to kind of push the envelope as much as I can. I, I've mentioned it a few times that I'll, I'll say it again. I I cannot imagine what the Golden Demon at Adepticon this year is going to be like. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be insane. And Just the, the the miniatures that are going to be in that cabinet are I prepare for like your mind being blown when you and, walk by and, and the painters that are going to be there. Yeah, um, you know, I'm already hearing that Jeffrey Bowden's going to be back. He he's going to be back competing. Um, Todd Swanson is talking about being back. Carol's talking about being back. Um, Chris Bohr, I'm sure he's going to put in some stuff. Joe Ortiz, he's going to be there. I mean, the old guard is all going to be there. So I'm super excited for guys that haven't been on the scene and haven't been painting in forever are all talking about being there. So I can't, I can't wait for it. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm (laughs) I'm super (laughs) excited for it. I'm super excited. It's going to be, it is going to be a crazy year. I I just can't wait to see what everybody has knowing that. Cause exactly that it's going to be everybody who's been competing the last couple of years, you know, probably more and bigger and, 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 and so on. And everybody who hasn't competed for a few years, everybody's going to come back. Plus everybody knew a bunch of people, you know, you know, who might not have ever competed before. Oh, right. And they're sitting there working their butts off. Like they're right now they're out there. They're planning. I know them. I, I can see out there. There's so many good painters right now that never got to compete in Golden Demons. I can't right. wait to see what they say, what they do. You know, Chris Sure. I mean, so many. Um, I mean, your stuff, dude. You've been just killing it going over there at, at UK. Or, um, you know, your Necromunda squad. Oh, so gorgeous. So gorgeous. <laughs> um, so I'm, ex- I'm so excited. I'm, I'm so excited. There's going to be so many painters. This can be really exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. So anyways, uh, back on topic. Woo. Um got into, you know, teaching and stuff, um, wanted to do more, wanted to figure out more, have more access to the community and stuff like that, because uh, I was really enjoying taking people's painting up a little bit and showing what I like. Right. You know, I, I learned from all of these golden demon winners and stuff like that. And, you know, I was able to just grab as much of that information. And because, you know, I was taught it, I feel it was 
kind of my job to share that too. Yep. Um, so I started working and I got contacted at a, at Adepticon one year by uh, Chung with uh, War Gamers Consortium. You know, and they had a lot of YouTube videos, stuff like Lesser Bursley, uh, Chung, and um, gosh, I forget what the name of his other. He was like Samurai, Samurai Painter or something like that. He was a uh, he was an American, like an expatriate or something that moved okay. to Japan. Um, you know, they all kind of wanted me to start doing stuff. We put in together a few programs, like the the mentors program, which the goal was take high end painters, uh, people like AJ Thornton. Uh, myself, um, Bryce Kokenauer, just a, a few painters that really wanted to give back to the community and started to try to build a, a program with that. At that time, uh, Hobby Hangout started. Okay, and, got it. I, and I saw everything that was happening with the Google Hangout system and what Hobby Hangout was doing, all that stuff. Wanted to be part of it. You know, I, I encouraged all the artists that were part of the WGC to get in there and start doing that stuff. You know, we got a little sidetracked with things like the Draconic Awards program, which I really liked because it really taught me about the judging side of painting and trying to develop a system. And I, I man, I struggled for a few years and tried to write up the the best way to try to make a judging system for painting miniatures unbiased um which man that's a rabbit hole we could talk about for the next hour just oh just sure absolutely it. um but you know it was all the stuff that was based on the community getting getting these journeyman painters to get in and get excited and not feel that they couldn't compete in a paint contest because you know you got to paint with the master so we developed that journeyman that journeyman program that you're starting to see in a lot of events now, which I'm super excited for. I, I think that we had a lot of the the core of that. I know that there were a few other programs like that around, but I think we're the ones that really brought that to the fore with the Draconic Awards and let people see, hey, you know, it it's more than just winning golds and, and and having the top painters there, but building the community. And I love that, you know, Nova and a lot of these different uh, events are embracing that idea right. of building the community. Um, so super excited about that stuff. We got into WGC. I met Kat through that. Um, did WGC for a little bit. Um, you know, I think just me and Chung's goals kind of bisected a little bit. Um, I think he wanted to kind of stay in the area that he was, and I wanted to kind of push into new realms. So we decided to kind of separate. And uh, I was actually on a drive home from Kingdom Con, um, talking with Kat, uh, and she really encouraged me to, hey, let's why don't you do your own thing? Why do you need to to have somebody else you're doing this with? Why don't you do your own thing? And I, I wasn't super confident in it, um, but she talked me into it and she finally said, I'll tell you what, I'll help you out. If if you want to do this, <laughs> I'll help you do it. And and I'll, I'll work with you and I'll build that. And um, yeah, that was, that's how CK Studio sprang up. And um, we're we're actually this next month, right before Nova, we're going back to our very first venue of where we taught our first class. We're nice. gonna go back there and we're gonna do a private event with the Beers and Bolters guys. Um, they were the first ones that had me out for a, for a class and it's kind of neat to go full circle with that. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of my story. That's, uh, that's how, CK Studios in a nutshell, pretty much. Nice. I wonder what Kat would say now, what, what her current self would say to her past self. Uh, I think she'd still be on board, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. She works yeah. hard. We, we were just, uh, we were just doing a, a podcast recording, you know, uh, promoting the Titan and all that stuff. And we were mentioning that it's been three years now and yeah, that we're going for, for full circle. And she's like, yeah, I'm amazed that we put up with each other that long. <laughs> uh, I got a good laugh out of that. You know, she's still got a good sense of humor about it, but um, we're excited. We love where CK studio is going. We love that. We got the opportunity to bring you guys in um, really showcase your guys' talents and make, uh, hopefully a bigger impact on the community, you know, uh, on the hobby on a whole. That's that's what we're after. And being able to to work with these other artists, work with you and work with Justin and work with Sam. Uh, and then Dev, you know, I'm, I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but Dev's going to start doing the one day classes yep. in UK. I mean, so, you know, we're, we're still growing and we're still building on what we were doing. So um, it's awesome, man. I'm, I'm really excited for what the future holds for us. Now, the one thing I want to I want to sort of dig into there as well is when did you integrate, you know, sort of and, and be and and uh, when did you sort of the airbrush come into it? Right. Because one of the things you are very well known for is being an absolute master, you know, with the airbrush. Right. And this is a big part of, all, of some of the classes 
um, that CK Studios teaches, obviously, and, and yourself. So, like, where did that where did that happen? Where did that join the stream there? Um, back 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 just before I started with WGC, I was doing a few local airbrushing classes. Um, nothing real incredible or anything like that. But w when WGC picked me up, part of what they really liked was uh, what I was doing with the airbrush, the techniques I was developing and stuff like that. Um, so I got with Chung and WGC. And of course, WGC was sponsored by Badger at the time. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, you know, Chung and uh, and Ken shot, shot, shot Phil. And like, I always mispronounce his name. But anyways, Badger Ken. Badger um, Ken, yeah, yeah, that's how I, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're really good friends, and um, so you know, Ken showed up one day at a, at a at a show and said, "Hey, I want to support you," and it which really worked out well for me because I would teach these classes, and I was teaching on the Harder and Steenbeck uh, Infinity Airbrush, and at the time there wasn't really any U.S. distributors for it yet. Right. So it was stupid expensive. I want to say we paid like three seventy five a brush. Me and Damon and a whole bunch of guys that took Matthew's class all went in and bought it. Uh, that was another guy that was actually at that class was Damon. Oh my Jay. god! For <laughs> I mean, it was <laughs> this is the greatest class yeah. in the history of classes. So, um, yeah. Um. Anyways, you know, I teach the class and I get done at the end of the class and the students would go, "Hey, you know, I really like this idea of airbrushing and stuff like that. How much is a brush?" And they'd ask me how much I paid for mine. I'm like, well, it was three seventy five, you know. And they're like, ah, uh, you know, I think I'm gonna stick with brush painting. Right. So, so I really needed an alternate means of airbrush. I, I needed a different airbrush. It was just too expensive. It was just turning people off for the whole idea of airbrushing. Um, so you know, when Ken when Ken and Badger stepped in, it was like you know perfect because very affordable brushes very affordable brushes i mean you know for the price you're getting the quality you're getting it's 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 a great brush especially that 105 you know i mean that right thing, I, call, I call it the ak-47 of airbrushes because it'll just i i joke that it'll shoot gravel um <laughs> you, you know that's that that's just that brush um so um that's when the airbrush classes really started taking off and there weren't a lot of people teaching airbrushing at conventions um i had the support of badger so i could show up with a full spread of airbrushes and ken would would bring in manifolds so that we could paint off of co2 tanks and all of that stuff and we started to introduce airbrushing classes at conventions um, i want to say the first one we did was adepticon okay uh, we were able to do um, a, a full hands-on instead of just a demo airbrushing demo class. It was a full hands-on airbrushing class. So that's where that came from. Um, when we started CK Studios, our our second class that we taught was actually a brush painting class. It was a uh, um, painting display quality figures. We worked on the the uh, Black Suns Barbarian. You know, oh yeah, sure, sure. Fantastic skin tones or like that. Really great brush paint but actually it's a really great airbrushing model yeah. also just because of the sculpt of it but we did that class and um man everybody in that class was like hey next time do the airbrush class we want to do the airbrush class we want to do the airbrush class and then all of a sudden you know we were getting calls from all these people that were seeing these classes and they said hey we want an airbrush class too we want an airbrush class too and it just blew up from there and that's i think that's where it became kind of known as the, the airbrush class and we haven't really taught a brush class outside of conventions we haven't taught a brush painting class um until sam started it right he was, he was the first one just to actually go back to start teaching brush painting classes um because just you know that's where the market is and people want to learn the airbrush and, right. and we love sharing it because talk about a, a hobby multiplier you know uh, independent characters talk about that hobby force multiplier that airbrush is definitely it and uh man i encourage you if you're not using an airbrush definitely look into it it's not hype it's not um cheating it's it it takes an immense amount of skill to to be able to use it but what a great tool to have in your in your toolbox. And I, I use the airbrush on every miniature that I paint. Absolutely. You know, what I always tell people is like, you're going to make more money in your life. You're going to you're going to do a lot of things in your life, but you're never going to get more time. And if using the airbrush, I can use to shortcut out, you know, some steps if I can achieve things that I want to do faster. Um, that right there, worth it. That just became worth it right there. Right. And I, you can do a lot more than that. The bar is a lot higher than that. But even if that were the bar, it would be completely worth it because I will never get that time back. That is the most precious resource, yep. right? 
So just, you know, don't waste your time ever on anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So right on. Okay. So awesome stuff. Uh, shall we take a look? Speaking of this journey we went on, shall we take a look at some of the pieces from that journey? How about that? Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to lock on myself here and get, bring up the photos. There we go. And then we'll share it up here. All right. By the way, everybody watching, enjoy this last time that the audio is nice and even and clean and it's easy to share. This will be the last time because the Hangouts goes away in like three days. But Caleb gets the last. <laughs> It'll be all complicated from here on out. And you can thank YouTube for that. Here we go. All right. So uh, here we go. Here we have a little orc fellow with a wrecked jet. And you know, one thing I'll say, <clears throat> Caleb is one thing, and I, I want I want to know if this maybe comes from, you know, you mentioned like being into uh, sort of, you know, military hardware, that kind of thing, right? And obviously I know that there's some of your professional life involved in that too, for obvious reasons, but it, I, you do such a great job with like weathering an atmosphere and environment on vehicles. Like it's something that stands out in your work repeatedly of having like really nice elements of wear and tear and, and stuff like that. So, and it, it's what caught my eye immediately about this thing, just like nice uses of pigments and scratches and you know, the bending of the propellers, just little tiny touches everywhere that I really liked. Th this was such a fun project. This is one of my first projects that I started to learn uh, composing the scene of a model. Um, it, it doesn't quite work, which is funny, um, but I really, uh, you know, I'd, I'd listened to, I'd taken a class with Roman Lapat and he talked about um, vectors and creating weight and, and shape with your bases, you know, and you need to have those heavy elements and those lighter elements and medium elements and intermixing them and playing with solid surfaces and soft surfaces. And I introduced all of that into this piece trying to, to do it. So if you look at the piece, you'll see, um, the first thing is, is look at the airplane. You'll see all the vectors in there that really point your eye towards the orc from the bent propellers to the wing in the back, to the tree on the side, to the plant in the front and the, the, the placing of the rocks and the development of the rocks and stuff like that. Um, I was really learning and playing with that development and that that um, composition of it. The only issue was, and I didn't realize it at the time, is that one thing that doesn't work too well is ending your piece at the diagonal in the front of a model. Or, uh, or I'm sorry, not in the front of the model, but in the front of the base. So if you see on the plinth, the focus is into the corner of the front. Right. And a lot of people struggled with that, trying to figure out where the direction of the model was. And so I learned some things from there. And what I should have actually done with this was squared off that corner and and cut some of that diagonal off. And, yeah, I wonder if the other option would have also been to not have the brighter, harder elements down in that corner, right? So if that corner had sort of like fallen off into more darkness and the brighter elements were up top, you know, like like up in this area here where it would have, you would have flattened it with the elements, yeah, right? You could have sort of achieved the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that exactly. And you can see it's a very hard edge at the bottom. It frames the bottom of the piece. And one of the things you don't ever want to do, I mean, you know, developing and learning is you don't want to trap the eye into the piece and uh, you got to give them an exit. And unfortunately, when you come down on those rocks, it traps you into a little unfinished area. Um, so I learned a lot on this piece. Very fun piece. I loved it. Um, I, I learned an immense amount on it and uh, I had a really good time with it. Unfortunately, uh, as I was finishing this piece, I had a pretty big wreck um, racing and I, I busted my wrist really bad. And uh, so I didn't get to finish it. And when I, I took it to Crystal Brush unfinished and um, they the judges tore it apart. There was some stuff that was, I, I came back and eventually finished it afterwards. But um, so it, unfortunately it didn't take uh, uh, any awards that year. I was really hoping it would. And I felt it went into the category. It was a strong contender, if not for the mistakes. Sure. Uh, for the unfinished areas, but it was a very fun piece. I, I learned so much on it. That's awesome. I love his face. He has such a wonderful expressive face. It's everything great about work faces and you captured it so well. Like, and, and one of the things I do want to draw everyone's attention to is you did a really nice job with your light triangle, drawing attention to the face. Like you talked about the angles, but it's not just the angles, right? And I'm, 
absolutely positive this is an intentional choice. Like, not only do you have your sight lines, you know, leading toward his head, like, well, look away from here for a moment, but you have the nose tip here and the wing tip here being bright, creating this, you know, the your sort of bright triangle, right, where it's leading the multiple lines, uh, as you said, like vectoring down to his face, which is the brightest element of him, that and his goggles, right? So you got a bright blue and a bright yellow, two very eye-catching colors, which really yeah. draws you in. So, yeah. yeah, I did a lot of light contrast. You'll see another triangle with the the bottoms of the the tops of his knees and the goggles. Yep. yep. Um, did a lot of triangles. You know, I was learning that with with creating triangles and shapes. Um, the vectors, the the tonal values. I used warm and cools, um, putting in warm greens and yellows. You know, to help shift the eye, and then putting in those very cold blues. Um, it was very fun. I, I I just you know I put I tried to put as much of what I was learning and developing to use in a piece. It's awesome. All right. So next up we have uh, we have this. This is a girl, I think, right? <laughs> this, this is Bray Brayleen. Uh, and here's this. Oh no, sorry. It's this one. There we go. I thought I had that zoomed out, but I didn't have the zoom out. I'm sorry. Do I, do I, oh man, I wish I had the overall photo. I should have sent you the overall photo. So this is an entire. This is more of a diorama scene. Um, she's coming out of a saloon. It's got the little saloon sign that's all shut up. If you see off to her to her right on the left side of the photo, you can see a little wanted sign of her. Um, so, you know, that's her coming out of the saloon, guns drawn, you know, guns blazing. I kind of picture her of like, a, uh, if you ever watched um, uh, Young Guns, you know, when they get oh, yeah. in that room and he gets the other guy all wrapped up to look like him. And he says, we're coming out, but we're coming out shooting. Um, yes. I picture that of the saloon doors blowing open as she charges out. Uh, the fun thing is if you flip it around to the other side of the piece is the inside of the saloon. Um, there's a little... Uh, jackalope that Bryce had sculpted for me and a little spittoon and just all these little, these little fun de uh, developmental elements in it. So very fun piece to do. Uh, I did that for um, the privateer press uh, contest in, um, in Gen Con. Gen Con is where that, that went. Oh to. yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like one of their, one of their bigger ones outside of lock and load itself. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah. that's a big, they have a big competition at Gen Con. And, and that's a fun event there that took a, a, um, a gold, you know, that's a, it's not, ex excuse me. It's not podium based. It's merit based. Yes. Um, and the, the, I want to say that year, the best of show came out of that category. It was one of Sam Lentz's piece. Um, so that was fun. Uh, again, you know, learning a bit with, with, uh, developing a, a piece and, and creating shape and volume and, uh, activity and motion. And, and this was all about creating forward movement and motion with the, with the model. So I had a really good time with it. I still actually have this piece, uh, in the case, which I, I'll probably hang on to her forever. So it, it was very fun. She's, she's super awesome. And again, I, I remember seeing this one and I really loved it because, because of all the little details that you did put in here. And I realized I do have the big picture. I just had failed to move it into the folder. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So here, I'm just going to bring it over here so we can uh, see there it. We go. There we go. Let's zoom in here. Yeah, there you go. So you can see the whole saloon. And you can see on the little cargo boxes, there's the little uh, emblem for uh, Kate, Kate, Kate. Kador, I can't remember what the factions are called, um, but they'd be the guys that were hunting her and stuff. So. Gotcha. Yeah, very fun piece. Very fun. It's piece. awesome. All right, so, so there you go. Sorry about that. Somehow it didn't get into the folder. I pulled them all down, and then that one wasn't there. All right, next up, this guy, one of our yeah. uh, Death Corps, right? Death Corps. Yep, De uh, Death Corps Commissar. Um, whew, talk about a learning experience with this piece. Um, this, this is the mob. If you guys have heard the, the funny story, uh, I uh, I decided to take this one. I didn't have very many pieces. I just want to take a couple pieces with me to UK. We were teaching in the UK, and uh, I wanted to bring a piece. Oh, my God. Is this the piece? This is the piece. Okay. Um, I love it. This story is insane. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're staying at Dev's house in, in London, and we got to go to Bingham. Uh, Coventry. Coventry, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we got to go up to Coventry for Games Day or uh, Warhammer Fest. It, it's called now. And, and for those uh, outside the UK, that's like maybe let's call it what two hours ish drive yeah, up like right? the M twenty five M one. Yeah, yeah, it's about two hour drive and a little farther because Dev is at the south end of London. Okay, um, so you're really driving, you know, quite a distance. And um, 
driving on the wrong side of the road. Yes, it's trying, always a fun time. Trying to get in cars and figure out how to get in cars and carry things and juggling stuff and being just, you know, discombobulated. At some point, I had set that model on the fence post. And it was still it was still in its its little Tupperware container and everything, you know, to protect it. But I'd set it in um I'd set it in uh on, on that post and got in the car and didn't realize it was there and we got all the way to Coven Coventon Coventry. Right. Coventry. Yeah. Got all the way there, got out of the car and went to go grab my piece and went, oh no. <laughs> And I just looked at Kat and she said, I just turned ghost white. And she's like, what's the matter? And I said, I left that model sitting on the fence post. And she's like, well, were you like super attached to it? Um, you know, do you really want it to enter it? Because I'm sure it'll still be there. You know, it's just sitting on a fence post down in the middle of the suburbs of London, like right on the main street. Um, <laughs> You know, and I walked inside and we got about 15 feet into Warhammer Fest. And I just told Kat, I said, you know what? I'm not going to enjoy this event. I'm going to stress about this. I got to go back and get it. Yeah, I think so, you walked in and like we bumped into you almost right away. Yeah. Right. Because my wife was there. And so <laughs> you and Kat, and that was like the first time my wife met you. And you were like, I was like, oh, hey, how you doing? We caught up for like a second. And then you were like, I got to go. <laughs> and you just left right back out. Yep. And jammed, jammed back to London, got the piece, got back. There was about 35 minutes left of Warhammer Fest at that point for the day. Um, got the piece entered, uh, was able to enter it into the competition and all, everything for the next day. And uh, I could breathe a sigh of relief. I got back to London and man, it was still sitting on that fence post. It had poured rain. Yeah, I was going to say, it also rained. rained that day. Yeah, because it's oh, the UK. Yeah. Of course it rained that day. Right. So, I mean, luckily it didn't get damaged. Luckily, you know, nobody grabbed it or knocked it off or broke it or anything like that. Um, so it was very, whew, that, that was a, that was a close one. So, um, yeah, I, that's, that's the story behind that piece. Yeah, to say harrowing experience, I think does not capture it all. Like, I can't imagine the heart attack that I would have. Like, yeah, I, I feel like when I'm carrying my stuff around, I need to do, especially, you know, if I'm going over there to compete, I need to do that thing they do with like the nuclear codes where it's like on a handcuff attached to your wrist, you know, right. or whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I love this guy. It's great. I love the scene you set for him, like both the uh, the modern stuff on the horse's feet, showing how just the world this guy is living in, right? Uh, the sort of uh, bunker, like very much trench warfare thing that's implied by the basing. Uh, I, I love it. It's a very fun piece. Very fun piece to do. Yeah. All right. Next up, we've got this guy. This this needs a story because this is like the craziest, coolest thing. Like the, again, the I want everybody to really dial in on like the elements of the weather and the wear and the atmosphere, like of the world this miniature inhabits. It feels so real and so wonderful. Like you've got the different tones of rust, the different kinds of weathering going on. I really like it. S super fun piece. Um, it all started just based off the model. Uh, when I first got the model, um, I looked at him and I said, man, um, I got to change my paint style for this model. And, and, and I'm uh, one of the, like the, the systems I really, I talk about when I talk about composition and building a model is models almost talk to you and tell you how they need to be painted. And, and this one just, I don't know, it needed to be that very borderlands, um, cartoon style painting. Uh, and then, you know, you got the duck with the gas mask and all that stuff. It just really encouraged that. So um, what I want to do is I really wanted to present Bill. I think his name is Bill Tycho or Tycho or something like that. Um, I really wanted to present him. So when I painted him, I wanted him to slightly contrast with the elements around him. Right. And I didn't want him to really tie into him. So you'll notice a, a big style change between the, the way everything around him is. And then the closer you get to him, the more cartoony everything gets. Right. Uh, the, beer, the beer cans start to get a little cartoony, but in the backgrounds, everything's a lot more neutral and natural. Um, 
I just wanted to really tell that story and create that atmosphere with it. And it was interesting because I'd never really tried to introduce both weathered regular metals, metallics, and non-metallic metals together. And I wasn't sure if it would work or not. And um, I was happy that it did because uh, the way the piece composed, uh, it really presented him and it gave that whole Borderlands feel. Everybody that saw the piece was just like, yeah, Borderlands, you know? Right, yep. Um, I think Borderlands 2 had just dropped at that point. So, uh, you know, there's a guy very similar to him on the cover of that game. Yeah, the, yep, yep, yep. The one of the one of the dudes with the masks. Yes, he he absolutely has that feel. The big goggles, all the crazy gear on him, the gas mask. There was somebody who in the comments who asked, "Did the duck come with? The, did the duck with the gas mask come with him, or was that a separate thing?" No, that that came with him. Um, Jeremy actually sculpted that one up, and it, he's now a a part of the. If you buy that figure, you can get that that duck with it. Um, so I, I don't have very good sculpting skills, so that was beyond <laughs> me, but, uh, Jeremy sculpted that up. Nice. Yeah, it's great. And I, I do like, I like the combination of using like real weathered metals and stuff with non-metallic. I think it's absolutely a sellable thing. I think people should be less afraid of combining the two elements as long as they're used, you know, in sort of a way that's sort of logical. I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, so yeah. yeah. This guy's fantastic. The goggles, really. I love how you have, you've used the sort of green of it so sparingly. A couple elements on his belt. Again, like this angle, I'm sure, like in seeing the piece, I know what people would see is green here, green here, green here. So again, we have a nice um, triangle coming out. Uh, the the goggles being so bright, like they're so eye-catching. They absolutely draw you right to the face. So even amongst all this bright cartoony stuff, uh, you still get drawn to his face. A little thing that you did here that I really want to draw people's attention to because it's a simple element, but I see people forget it a lot on display bases. You made this central area of, you know, sort of where the miniature is lighter, right? Like you lit the the sort of floor scene almost here to, again, just sort of create the, the, the idea that this is the center of the stage, right? In the same way theaters use this kind of lighting to to show like you know where the actors are and where you should be looking you used that here rather cleverly yeah uh, I, I got a one of my biggest compliments um uh, an artist that i've always just loved watching and uh you know watching him develop it was uh rafa pika rafael pika and uh i took this piece to nova and uh entered it in there and it took best of show um rafa and roman were the judges and when Rafa came back, he was so excited, you know, when I when he came back to after the show, you know, to talk to me about the piece. He was so excited about the elements of the roof and all of that stuff. And he said it just sold it for him. Um, so, you know, that's exciting when when a, a guy that you look up to like that, the, one of those painters comes in and starts telling you how great there is. He was encouraging me to, to take that piece to Monty that year. Um, too intimidated for Monty. I'm still too intimidated for Monty. <laughs> I, I understand that completely. What I'll say is that I think that is such a high compliment from him, not just because Roman is just one of the greatest artists in the world, but because he's also an absolute master of things like weathering and, you know, like those naturalistic elements. So when he says he loves how you've captured it, that means something. Cause this is a guy who spent just days of his life in real time, staring at like, weathering and he loves that kind of basis that tell an organic natural story right that capture those elements of the world yeah uh so oh what is monte sorry somebody in the comments asked monte san savino it's a uh, uh probably i would say I, I don't know it's hard to say at this point but it's it's one of the tougher most sort of prestigious miniature painting competitions in the world it it's sheer size and magnitude and scope it happens in italy in Monte San Savino, hence where it's named for. And um, it's like just the 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 sheer scope of the entries there is mind boggling. It's so I get it. Uh, that being said, I think this would have been strong. I agree with him. I think this would have been a very strong piece because what you I think what you you know, one of the things you really need there is you have to have a, a unique vision, right? Because there's going to be 500 pieces in whatever category you're in. Yep. Right. Yeah, you definitely have to have something nice and unique. And, and this is like, this has such, this has such an attitude about it, 
right? That is just so rarely captured. Um, like there's nothing about this that doesn't drip with intention, with atmosphere, with your, with the choices you've made to tell a story coming out through what you've expressed here. So I think it's really good. It's great. Okay, cool. I dig this guy. The duck. Oh, somebody asked. Uh, so this is a kit people can currently get. Where do people yeah. get it? Because lots yeah. of pe uh, people love this duck and this figure. Uh, fig figone, figone dot fr. Got it. I'll I'll find it and I'll throw it in the description. I'll throw it in the show notes. Uh, let me make a note real quick so I remember to do that. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. Cool. Uh, now we come to the piece. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier in the show, this is the one. So this is, uh, I like, obviously this is a zoom in on the banner, but I actually want to jump to here so people can sort of see the whole unit. Right. So, and, and I, I want to hand this over to you to kind of share the whole story behind this thing. Uh, because, I think you ended up giving them even a new base after this, right? Uh, like this um, was their first base. Is that the first base or is that the... No, that is the current base. Okay, that... got it. The first one was the temple with the roof. This was the second one? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, like so, I said, I remember this well. I just yeah. didn't remember what order it happened in. But yeah, these are so gorgeous. And I think you took... Did you take silver or gold the year in, in unit for Crystal Brush with these? <laughs> Silver, silver. Okay. Yep. Silver, or gold. Uh, no, no, silver. That's right, because that's part of the story for these guys. Oh, all right. Well, I'll shut up now and and just say that these were. I mean, it just blew me away. Uh, so please, yeah, share. S super fun, uh, fantastic project. Um, the minute I saw these guys come up on Forge World, I was like, uh, I'm painting them the Palantine blades. Just their swords, their attitude, just the shape of them and everything. I'm not a big Emperor's Children fan you know, but just these models just spoke to me. They were like, man, they need to be painted in the most exquisite non-metallic metals you could possibly do. Um, studied, 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 studied non-metallic metals. I've always felt like I struggled at it a little bit. So I really struggled on it. Um, while I was starting this piece and you know how some of the golden demon pieces entries go, you, you might work on them for a year. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. So um, while I started with these guys, um, painting, painting Buddha was running a contest. Um, it was their end of the year where they would do like the, um, what is that called? Where each day they open a little box and it gives a little thing. Um, they're the little event calendar things. I forget what they're called. Um, anyways, they were running one of those for, for the holidays for Christmas. Okay. And um each like day. a little loot box type of thing? Kind of, yeah. There, um, GW does it every year. I can't remember what it's called. You know, and like e each day, Black Library will do a new book. Oh, and, like an advent calendar. Yeah, it's like an advent calendar thing. And so they were doing that. And if you followed through and there were clues through it, and if you followed all the clues, you had to answer these questions at the end. And if you answered those questions correctly at the end, you were put into these drawings. And it was everything from models to all this stuff. Well, the grand prize was a trip to germany to paint with ben comets um and i ended up winning it <laughs> so um i made plans and and you know how it works when you get to when you have a, a, a spouse that works for the airlines you get to fly for free for things so i, I was able to do the the standby stuff and I, I made a whole trip out of it flew over to berlin sat and painted with ben for three days, um, we did a bust and a few things like that. But while I was there, I was able to pick his brain on it. He kind of helped adjust me a little bit on some of the non-metallic metals, how to change things. Uh, one of the really big tips that he taught me was the interaction of black and yellow. And when you interact um, a black, because blacks are based in blue, and this really right. got, this really was kind of a basis for how I understand color theory a little bit more now, and why um, the techniques that we use with our airbrushing are the techniques that we use. Is uh, he taught me to intermix the ochre with the black um, to create my shadows for my non-metallic metals because they it turns green, right, uh, and it gives just this depth and density to non-metallic metals. Um, so that was one of the little techniques that really got featured into these guys. Um, he really helped me work with light. 
still had to figure out the banner. Uh, I had no idea what banner to do and I needed something super elaborate. You know, it's, it's the, the emperor's children and this is pre you know this they're, is yeah pre they're not bringing some like you know basic banner along no no right. right so um i had to figure out something for it. i couldn't figure out anything well part of my trip was going over to uh munich and visiting rafa and roman at their studio in augsburg and um as part of that you know um we went and we we toured the city gorgeous city if you guys ever get a chance to go to augsburg i can't suggested enough gorgeous city but when we got there we went into the palace and up on the palace were these giant murals and these murals told stories and there was a guy there and he was explaining what all the elements of these murals looked like or what they meant and they were painted in all of these off bone almost uh tan colors just like what i have here so i sat there and i took all these pictures and they taught this whole story and they they explained this whole story about what they meant and and um it was all about the establishment of augsburg and how the ruling family established the town and all this stuff so i took all of those ideas all of those elements and it became a banner so i'll kind of walk you through the banner a little bit and it starts at the very top of the banner and works to the bottom and this banner tells a story all right um, i'm excited so, so so if you look at the very top of it you can see the aquila the the emperor's aquila it, it's the symbol of the imperium and you'll notice with this aquila is that both of the eyes not only is the one eye that's blind not there but also the eye that is there is closed if you, you'd have to really zoom out, i don't know if the picture will give it but the eye is closed um and and the reason for that was was this is just before the fall of the emperor's children and that chaos was starting to kind of work its way into the legions they had the uh they had the warrior lodges and all that stuff and you're supposed to have the imperium watching over the the emperor is supposed to be watching over his sons and, and and their offspring and he's kind of turning a blind eye to it he's he's looking off at other things he's not paying attention to what's right in front of him nice so so that's what's going on with the aquila and then as you come down you'll see uh the the two servants you know they'd be considered the servants of the emperor and that's to represent the legion the the space marines themselves so you can see they're holding the three which is the third legion it's it's the emperor's children legion um and next to them and it, it looks like they have wings on them but it's not actually them that have wings beside them are helpers that have wings and that's supposed to be the development of these guys into space marines and how the 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 geneticness and and the operation of the the uh you know when fulgrim finally was taken into the imperium how a bunch of his sons that he'd already progressed with became space marines so that's right. what that story is telling but if you look at the bottom they're mutating and the bottom of their legs aren't feet their bottom of their legs become oh yeah turn into ladders and they connect to the dogs and those dogs are the basis for what the imperium is built on you can see the three is is being held up above them it's being stacked on top of them and then if you look really close um above the dogs is the little it's it's almost like the crest of the uh the uh the um uh, emperor's children and then in the banner it talks about the emperor's children in latin um so the dogs are being corrupted and then they're sitting on a death's head of course you know you have to have your skulls introduced into it but the very bottom is the most interesting part of it and there's two characters at the very bottom on the banner's right hand side so our left hand side as we're looking at it is actually horus and um back in in um early mythology when you go into like uh egyptian mythology and stuff like that when when you had a deity when you had a god they represented that god with a burst of light above it and that was supposed to be um how it showed them to be above so anytime you see uh images of pharaoh or something like that you'll see that that burst of light or that sun behind it because the god Ra, the sun god is is kind of developing you know is is giving them that that uh however it works so that they're a deity and right so that's to represent i mean you you see it it, it kind of it kind of worked its way into christianity with the halo that's really the right yeah being halo. like right you'll see that in a lot of like renaissance and pre-renaissance art right yeah right and and actually in pre-renaissance art you won't really see the halo so much as you see the burst of sun yep 
with the rays of sun coming off and everything. So you can see that. So that's Horus, and he's going to be represented by that sun because he's a son of the emperor. You know, he's one of the primarchs, one of the the lords. Um, so he's haloed in light. He's got all the light around him. Then on the other side, you'll notice is a demon of chaos, and you see the black surrounding him that's been painted into, and um, what he's holding out to him, and and is in between them is is a scroll of knowledge yeah absolutely and it's so funny because like i can only see this little piece of white and i was like oh it's gonna be a little scroll that's gonna be knowledge yeah absolutely i love it and, and and you'll see the light on it there there's a lot of light like it's it's creating its own light um so he's given the light of knowledge to horus thus corrupting horus yeah it's all told into in, in this banner so that's the whole story of this banner it was, it was very fun to do um really pushed my freehand ability with it I, I i enjoyed it immensely it was a it was a really fun project what i think is so absolutely stunning about this banner and i it, it blew me away like i said from the first time i saw it but what i absolutely love is how much you do here with basically a monotone paint job right now it's not truly obviously right you have some other tones worked in here in places but you use such a tight range of color here, and yet it's so rich, right? It feels like uh, that clay fresco you were talking about. Like, again, I, I've never seen, obviously, exactly. The, I've never been to Munich or, or to Augsburg, but I can picture exactly what you're describing in my head. And you captured it so well with the depth, with basically a very small range of, of color, right? So it's it's just fantastic execution. And again, that's one of those things where you want to present stuff to the image um, and, and accent the piece. A lot of times, I mean, I know that people really love freehand and that freehand really draws. Um, but sometimes you'll see a lot of, of squads or figures, something like that, where the squad, the, the figure is only three inches tall and he's got an eight inch banner on him. Right. The, the freehand is exquisite, but it takes away from the figure. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about that a little bit. We'll talk more about that with the Titan. Um, by using these elements, um, you know, I was taught by Chris Bohr about elements of discovery, yep. the ahas, and I tried to use that banner as one of those elements of discovery. I didn't want it to carry the squad. I wanted it to accent the squad. The focus needed to be the squad, and you'll see the way they're standing and the way they're positioned. If you look at the models straight on for the way I developed them, you see the attitude and the, the aggressiveness of the Marines. The banner is secondary, but right. it draws you in closer. And then when you get in closer, you see the banner. And then you start to see the tapestry, you know, the the freehand that's on their their little uh, tabards and stuff like that um, to draw the eye and to create that shape and 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 just draw you into the storyline, get right. you into the story and get you focused on those those models and you want to know more about what they're doing. So that was the goal there. Um, I, th I think I nailed it. Um, they went to, there's a, a second funny side story about this is um, I took them to LVO and um, I, I was no longer running the paint contest there or anything. So I was able to, to just compete and everything like that. And I brought them, um, you know, so, some, some competitions don't have rules for what you can bring and what you can't bring. And I brought that and I brought um, Carl's Titan. Um, you know, mainly it was just to kind of show it off. I didn't think it would do too well. Um, the Titan wasn't paint to the painted to the high quality of what like a competition mini would be. The freehand was good, but it wasn't super great. Um, but while they were there, um, Alfon or not Alfonso, um, Angel Heraldus was there, and he was a guest judge. Oh and, yeah. Uh, Harder and Steenbeck had sent with him um, as a prize a best airbrushed. Um, it, it actually is, is written on it. It's, it's written uh, LVO 9, uh, 2018 best airbrush. Uh, <laughs> just funny. Um, but, you know, it was just a little bit of mistranslation. Um, but that was the, the award. And it was given to these guys. Um, the, the, it came down to which one was the best, the Titan or this. Um, they were trying to decide which one. And they chose this squad as the best airbrushed. And I didn't find this out until later on. I was just given the, the award. And, and when I got it, I assumed it was for the Titan. Um, they never said what it was for. And then I found out later on it's for this squad. Oh, that's funny. This squad nice. 
the squad never saw an airbrush. All of those blends were all hand hand blended, took forever. Um, just getting those really saturated purples, um, learning how to paint purples was huge on this model. Um, but it never, it was never airbrushed. So I thought that was kind of like a, a nice compliment to me that my blends were so good that they thought it was airbrushed. And you know, at, at that point, you know, 2018, I'm known pretty well for my airbrushing. Right. So it'd be easy to assume that, but um, yeah, they, they weren't, they weren't airbrushed at all. That is hilarious. And I think, yeah, I don't know of a, that's a, that's a very high compliment. Absolutely. Uh, no, this is awesome. And purple, especially this color purple you're in. I empathize with you. I cannot imagine how long you must've spent, spent getting the blends that smooth because woof, this yeah. kind of like, uh, uh, this kind of sort of violet without red where you're into that, that just pastel purple at the highlight is just one of the hardest things to keep smooth. You know, the, the magic to that, the trick to that was, and I owe cat for this one. Um, when I was working on these, uh, the, the highlights just kept desaturating, you know, you, you yep. try to highlight and how do you highlight with purple? You end up introducing white to it and it just kept desaturating. She says, you know what, instead of highlighting with white, why don't you start mixing in salmon with it? And of course, you know, she loves those colors. She loves being in those color ranges. And she said, try salmon and see what happens. And I started to introduce salmon into it. And then once I introduced the salmon, then I could start putting white in with the salmon to brighten the salmon. But because the salmon was in there, it didn't desaturate. And that's how I kept those really vibrant purples was by uh, by introducing salmon into the model. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a it is a well, well taken piece of advice. Like what like don't use one of the great tricks is don't use white with your purple, use a softer gray, like a gray green, which is, can be interesting because of the, the sort of pseudo complementary nature of it. Mm -hmm. You can use like a flesh tone. The salmon is one I haven't tried, but I'm going to give that a shot as well. That's really interesting. I like that idea. It has a little bit of warmth to it, you know, cause like salmon or like a salmon rose or something has that flesh tone adjacency, right? It, 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 yes, exactly. It's, it, it is, it's an adjacent to that. I, I use flesh tone as highlights and so much stuff now. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. It goes into so many things. Um, it just produces such a nice, warmer, softer highlight, right? Than using than using straight white. Yeah. All right. So that brings us to a big, big thing. So I hope everybody watching is excited because I'm excited because what we're going to do is we're going to go over to this thing right here <laughs> and we are going to I have the video here in the middle. And we're just going to go ahead and watch a little video. And now you, everybody else won't be able to hear it. Like probably we can or I can, but uh, you'll be able to see it. So you want to talk about this as we're as we're spinning around here? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, it's about 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> um, I just got back from Adepticon staff party. We went there last weekend and taught. And uh, just uh, you guys, man, when I got back, you guys had all of the parts to me. I'm so excited. Uh, actually, I got the stuff right before, um, right before I'd left. I got all of them and I got to unbox just a couple pieces and look at them and had to box them up immediately because we were leaving for two weeks. So um, when I got back, I was in such a rush to start to, to, to get it out and just show it off. So this is just, you know, this is uh, in the stages of assembly finally. Um, I really wanted to kind of go through and kind of highlight a lot of the, the freehand that you guys did, the colors that we got, everything. Unfortunately, it's not a super clean background because it's uh, it's it's just on my work desk. Um, I'm going to have better photos. I'm, I'm setting up the light booth. In fact, if you look behind me right now, you can see I'm sitting in the light booth uh, getting ready to, to get photographed with a better background and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, here, hold on. Let me stop sharing for a minute here. Sorry about that, everybody. No oh, there we go. Yes, so that is the Night Titan that is going to be the Warlord Titan, I should say, that is uh, that the studio has been putting together. Everybody in the studio pitched in here in a bunch of different ways, and it's incredible, uh, and it's going to be up for a raffle at the uh, Nova Open. And obviously, <coughs> the you know proceeds go to the Nova Open Charitable Foundation, uh, as you could see there, it's just, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I was up there, obviously up with, uh, Sam several weekends back working on it. Uh, Caleb did so much work. Like I, I cannot rationalize to all of you how much work Caleb did here. Okay. Like this thing is insane. I did like, 
we all kind of have the concept that these warlords are big, right? If you're not, if you don't, if you don't own this model, which I, who does, right? <laughs> um, you're like, yeah, it's big. And then like when you actually have it in pieces and we were working on it, we were just had the armor plates. We didn't have the whole thing like you did. I'm like, this just keeps going. How much is there? It's insane. It's insane. Uh, yeah. So it's gorgeous. It, it was such an incredible project. Um, it, it, I, I'm, I'm glad it's done. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it's definitely been um, a long road for this, but I think the detail and effort put into this is well worth it. I mean, whoever wins this is, uh, you know, uh, Carl said it, you know, a few people said it, this is absolutely a work of art. Um, there will not, there's not anything like this. This is a, a one of a kind, unique model. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if, you know, there's a few painters out there that might put the effort into doing something to that standard. I mean, it just, it, it's an incredible amount of work that everybody did. And I love that just the way this thing came together. Um, you know, a lot of the different parts were painted at different times by different people. And you're going to look at this thing when it's together and you're not going to be able to tell who did what. Right. Uh, which is just incredible. The, the meshing, the meshing of styles, the meshing of just everything that came into this, your guys freehand, oh, you guys nailed it too. And one of the things that, uh, that we talked about right at the start and I kind of stressed a little bit was don't go overboard with the freehand. Don't make that the centerpiece of the model. Make sure that the model is the centerpiece and use that freehand to really accent the, the piece. And, um, man you guys nailed it i mean and when people get in here and see the freehand what's going to happen is you're going to see the model you're going to see the colors of the model first and you're going to get closer and you're going to start to see some of the detail work and you're going to start to look closer and then you're going to start to see the freehand and you're going to start to see the chipping effects and the weathering effects and the, the light effects and just you know all the little nuances that are in there because they all just play together and you'll probably just lose yourself just sitting and watching this model for you probably stand there for an hour and just look at all the little variations in there and all the the shapes and stuff that you that are in there and the work you guys did was just so incredible and to get it done in a weekend i was blown away man when that <laughs> stuff came out when, when so i started a long thinking, weekend we got it I'm, done. Sure, I'm sure it was man but i i i'm unpackage that stuff and i was just like oh, oh this is gonna be so gorgeous so i couldn't wait to get it put together um i'm actually assembling the last little pieces uh here i have a few on my tabletop so if you guys want to get a little yeah sneak peek, some, absolutely some here I'll, I'll lock on you and you can switch over your camera so we can take a look at the last pieces all right so i'm gonna switch to my other camera there you go what now is this is it getting shipped as a whole thing to them then no i it's been magnetized um okay like got it you can see the the magnets oh yeah there you go head and stuff um it's been magnetized it comes with a kr case so kr sent us a case um it's gonna have custom cut foam in it uh it's gonna be very interesting with how we're gonna cut this i gotta do it's little like one inch tall pieces right and I'm gonna go in and cut each one almost tier style so that it fits the models and stuff like that so it's gonna be a little more work i, I have a bit more to do um but it's gonna be shipped uh it, it disassembles into the pieces that are all um magnetized the only thing i haven't figured out yet is how to magnetize the hand yet to make sure that it'll interchange with the weapons and what i'm thinking about doing is contacting our our uh, anonymous benefactor and see if they won't donate one more arm section um because the, gotcha. the arm the arm is magnetized up at the shoulder socket yep so if i can just get the section that comes off the hand this way um i guess it would be on this side coming up uh then the arm will be interchangeable too so it'll have the two weapons plus the, the hand that will come with it um but yeah i just wanted to kind of give a little close-up of of this model so um all of the armor plating and stuff on this was painted by justin kiefer the the chipping effects and the the weathering on it and everything like that and then i came in and uh did up the trim um i'm one make sure that that one artist did all the trim together um so that it tied together because it's a very unique style this is actually my part of the tutorial so um when when you guys come to adapt or to nova if you guys attend nova 
uh, at Nova, there's there's going to be a meet and greet where you get to meet the, um, the CK Studio team. And we're going to talk about the Titan project and everything like that. And everybody gets to talk about it. But we're also all um, uh, giving in or, or submitting in a work in, uh, um, uh, how to a tutorial on one of the subjects, one of the pieces that we did on the model, how we did it. Uh, and I chose the the trim and how we created, how I created the trim uh, using the airbrush and the paintbrush. And so it's a nice little step-by-step. -step. All of that is going to be compiled into a book. And that book also has the storyline that Carl wrote. Um, it's going to have some photos of the Titan and stuff like that into it, uh, along with the work in progresses um, and a little bit of about the artists and the artists get to talk about what they enjoyed with it and stuff like that. So it's going to be a neat little kind of collector's item that comes with the the Titan. Uh, the owner will get it. Um, it's probably going to be a signed edition from him where all the artists will sign it. Um, but then at the meet and greet, uh, you'll be able to get the book there too. Um, so. I think we're going to have like 50 copies of it or something like that. So uh, that'll be pretty neat too. We thought that would be a nice little fun side part of the project. And again, it'll help um, with the charity. It'll help uh, just, just increase what we're doing with the charity. Um, so this model is uh, the charity that this model is going to is while Nova Open is a charity foundation, they donate to a lot of different charities. We chose the Fisher House. Um, the Fisher House Foundation, uh, one, because it, it, it you know, it kind of speaks to the, the industry that I'm in or, you know, I work for the Department of Army um, and the Fisher House is for wounded warriors and vets that are injured. Um, it allows their their family um, to be able to uh, be there with them as they're going through the through the the struggles and the process they have from their injuries and stuff like that when they're yeah, in, in, in a medical uh and so I, I don't want to use all the military terms, but if they're in the hospital or something like that, and they're, sure. they're going through uh, their recovery process, that allows their family to be there, uh, to have a support system there. It pays for uh, lodging, uh, flights, uh, stuff like that. Um, so we're super excited to, to be uh, that the proceeds for this, this model are going towards the Fisher House. Um, yeah, it, I'm excited about it. So it's super cool. Yeah. And uh, and you do not have to be there to get raffle tickets. You can actually raffle. You can even if you're not going to attend Nova, you can still enter to win. So there you go. Yeah. A, 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 somebody is going to get this Titan for eight dollars. Right. That's it's that's a, the take home. Yeah. Ticket <laughs> and somebody is going to get this Titan for eight dollars, which is incredible. Uh, you know, Carl and Kat were sitting there and they were trying to estimate what the value of this Titan would be. Um, and Carl was stating he, he, he would guess that this would be valued somewhere around eight or nine thousand um, oh, dollars. Sure. If, if you think about the artists that have been involved in this, the detail work, the time that was put into this. I mean, just the time that was put into painting this hand is uh, mind boggling. And, and then you can kind of see the, the magnets on it and stuff like that. So uh, we, we really, uh, I think we outdid ourselves, Vince. I think we outdid ourselves here. <laughs> um, it's an awesome project. I can't wait to see it. I'll tell you what I'm really excited for. I'm excited for a you know, little less than a month and a half from now. Well, I guess even closer to a month now at this point. Wow, coming up fast. Uh, seeing it there, stay, you know, like in that big case. You know what I mean? Like just like, cause they have all the auctions set up kind of in one area there on the, um, I guess on second floor, whatever you want to call it there, that area. And just seeing it there and actually seeing it all together with all the work in person, even I'm thrilled about it. Right. Because I mean, obviously I don't think any of us, uh, have ever really seen it all together yet. Right. Like, I mean, obviously we've seen before paint and we've all seen we in the individual pieces we touched, but it's just, it's such a, it was such a fun project to work on. And I mean, I just, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it was so exciting. I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm just putting it together now. It's, it's just like, oh, I'm so amazed at how awesome this, this model end up, ended up coming out. It's just incredible. So yeah, I really want to thank everybody that was involved in it. Um, Justin, Dev, Sam, you, Kat, Carl. Uh, man, we had a great team behind this, and it was a it was it was a fun project. I'm ready to see it done. I'm ready to see it done. <laughs> it's it an incredibly fun project. It takes a village to make a knight to to make a a, a warlord. There you go. <laughs> it takes a village to make a warlord. 
Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, let's close out here with some little Q&A. So if anybody watching has some questions for Caleb over here on one of the sides of your screen, there's a little chat box where you can put in some comments. Feel free to drop those in. And while we're waiting on those comments to, or those questions to roll in, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions. So here we go. This is this is our lightning round questions. You, you can answer them as long as you want. but The questions right. are short and simple. All right. Here you go. Uh, what is your favorite piece your favorite miniature ever that wasn't painted by you that that wasn't, oh my goodness that wasn't painted by me that wasn't painted by you oh, yes oh my goodness um wow this is the section of the show where vince challenges people to pick one thing out of a list that is undoubtedly dozens long <laughs> there, there, there so many but honestly um one of the biggest pieces for me, um, probably the most influential piece for me, was um, the the um, oh, Todd Swanson one Slayer sword with it. Um, it was a Lilith Hesperix. Yeah, yeah, sure. Converted into a wood elf, and the sculpting on it, um, the paint use on it, the color combinations, the composition everything I, I remember seeing that piece in the case um you know walked up to, to there and saw that piece in the case and was just floored by it and just sat there and stared at it for hours um because it it was just so incredible and i mean yes there's probably been better pieces since uh you know you look at some of the stuff that lan is putting out or kirill kenev is putting out um a, a banshee you know some of these painters that are just incredible but for me that would be the most influential because it, it really made me open my eyes to all the different concepts of painting and made me want to just push the boundaries and paint as best as i could because just the, the piece was incredible nice nice i like it uh what do you listen to while you're while you're painting are you an audiobook guy music guy what do you what do you have on in the background it, it it varies it varies um I, I like music. I, I've tried to watch every once in a while. I try to watch, uh, like, turn on a TV show in the background or something like that, or listen to an audio book. Um, the problem is, I get so enveloped in my painting that you just you lose focus, and then I, I realize I've missed like three chapters of the book I'm listening to. Or right. Whatever. So I really like music, um, and it varies. I, my my music tastes are all over the place. Um, uh, you know, it, it started out, I was very much into punk. I, I like punk a lot. Um, I liked some drop kick, drop kick Murphy's and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Then, then having kids um, introduced me to the world of, uh, of pop music. And that has definitely made its way into uh, a lot of <laughs> my music library. Sometimes you got to look and go, what the heck is he listening to? Um, <laughs> You know, and then, and then, you know, there's, there's some, I, I still like rap music a bit. Um, the only thing I don't care for is, is country. I'm just not a big country fan. So that's, that's so funny. We have, it sounds like we have very similar music to musical taste overall. That's very funny. Yeah. Every once in a while, I mean, even some Adele will come up on my playlist. So, hey, know, look, there's you know, nothing you, wrong with that at all. You, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's, that's absolutely fine. Yes, I agree. Uh, I like all of those choices. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question. Who is your favorite miniature painter right now? Uh, other than yourself, that could be somebody from the past or current. Oh man. Um, my favorite miniature painter from past and current would be Rafa, Rafa Pika, uh, just because how much I learned from him, um, sitting down and having those paint sessions with him and, uh, sitting at, at Adepticon and just talking color theory and walking me through, uh, introducing me to things like Gamut and, uh, yeah, just everything. Uh, Rafa would, would by far, you know, be the top of the level there. Um, the painters that I, I look up to and I aspire to, um, definitely Todd Swanson, uh, Chris Bohr, uh, those are two old school standouts. Um, incredible painters matthew fontaine uh taught me so much about painting ah, man and there are some new guys coming on that are fantastic i shouldn't say they're new guys lan lan stuff is uh michael pin pin out pinoski yeah i, I think Pinowski. i don't know how to pronounce the last name either but yeah, yeah I, I let's just let's just say lan as lan uh his stuff's incredible ben comet i love ben comet style 
really like Sergio, uh, Sergio, Cal Sergio Calvo. Yeah, yeah. Calvo. I love Sergio's paint style. Um, yeah, gosh, the list is so long for, for right. the incredible painters up there. But um, there was a there was a thread that ran around recently on, in like in the of your metal group on Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah, that was like that. name your inspirations, and I was like, so I sat down to answer it. And my wife and I was just like working and working and working because I, I was like, I, I've got to try to get everybody. And I was like, I know I'm still going to miss people. And that's what killed me. Right. Because I was like, I hate answering this because I'm going to miss somebody. And then after I'm like, oh, gosh, God, how did I not think of it? Because, you know, trying to generate a list off the top of your head. And like 30 minutes later, my wife was like, what are you doing? You've been staring at your phone for like a half hour. And I was like, I'm trying to think of people. OK. <laughs> and, and that's so hard because the, the better you get at painting, the more influence you have. Right. The, the more people that are influential. I mean, you know, uh, you, you look at a creature caster piece. It doesn't matter what creature caster piece. The first thing I, I, I think about is, well, I'm going to go see how you painted it. I'm going to go see how Vince painted it because, you know, it's I, I can guess the colors it's going to be. But, <laughs> but I, sure. I, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm going to be inspired. So if I'm if I'm going to work on that piece and I want to do something, that's where I'm going to look. Um, uh, you know, some of the new guys. Um, you want an alternate color scheme and do something really different. Go look at that. Not original minis guy. Um, yeah. You know, his, just, just his color. You are like, wow, I would never have even thought to put those colors in. Where did he come up with that? But you know, it, it's so refreshing to see that um, flame on Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, that, that cartoon exaggerated style. There've been so many people that have accused him of like Photoshopping you know and adjusting his color saturation and that's how he paints and you look at that and you're just like that's incredible um there, there are so many influences out there uh i would just encourage everybody is don't get stuck in a rut of wanting to paint one style find out how that miniature is talking to you how it wants to be painted and then go find the styles that are painted that way and see if there's nothing wrong with emulating. There's nothing wrong. People say it's copying. People say it's stealing and stuff like that. But these artists are putting that stuff out there because they want people to see what they're doing and learning with it. There might be some little tricks here and there that they might not want to share. But, you, you know, there's never anybody that doesn't want to share a little bit of their talent with people in this industry. This is what the, this That's what miniature painting is based on is sharing. Um, so, yeah, so so many influences. I absolutely agree. All right, my final question: Do you lick your paintbrush? Yes. What's the, fact, what's your what's your favorite tasting paint? Oh my goodness, my favorite tasting. Mm -hmm. Um, gosh, like the I, best tasting paint. The, the best the best tasting paint is is Tamaya. Okay. Yeah. There you don't, go. don't 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 no. be taking out there. I say that. Don't go out there and taste Tamaya. Th those are on mistake. Um, I have tasted Pigment Fix. <laughs> uh, on, on accident i have tasted mineral spirits yeah oh yeah i was uh i had a brush that i had dipped into like 99 percent alcohol once and wasn't thinking about it and licked it and i was like ah! <laughs> as i light my mouth on fire yeah don't eat paint kids it's not good for you don't do it but i i really got to get out of the habit of licking brushes and i was thinking about that today because i was painting with uh the Vallejo silver um that's part of the edge highlighting for the models and I was licking my brush and my tongue goes numb when I, right. when I lick that brush. That cannot be good for you. <laughs> and I know, I know it's because of the paint and it, it makes the, the very top surface of your tongue slightly numb. So I got to stop licking my brush, but it's, it's a terrible, terrible habit to have. Where you can join, you can join in myself with the, uh, we're all in a support group of trying to stop. Absolutely. All right. And now let's go to some quick questions here from, uh, from the viewers. Uh, are you participating in Everchosen? You putting anything in the Everchosen uh, at a store this weekend? I'm not. I'm not. Um, this Titan has taken all of my time. And uh, I wanted to. Goodness sakes, I wanted to. I had a couple figures I really wanted to finish up and get to. Um, but I, I didn't get a chance to. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to get to compete in that, unfortunately. Right on. All right. Let's see. Uh, what do you think is next for uh, CK? More classes, more artists? Like, where do you want to go? More, cl more classes, more classes, more artists. Um, I, I'd like to say we're going to broaden our, our horizons a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think what we have is really tight. And I think we just want to um, 
create more. We want we want you, Vince, and we want Sam, and we want Justin to start f- developing the classes that you guys want to teach. And I know that that we've kind of handed you guys the first classes, and we're like, hey, this really worked. And you know, those were my ideas for classes. That's not necessarily what you guys want to do. So we want to develop and let you guys develop your classes. So we want to see more classes out there. Um, we want to see more classes with you guys. Um, more more tracks along that stuff. Um, uh, you're probably going to see us a little less at conventions. I, I we Me and Kat kind of sat down and talked the other week, and I think we're going to pull back a little bit on the conventions we're attending. Um, so I think we're going to stick to just a, just a few. Um, we we think uh, we hate to do that because we know that we get introduced to a lot of students at, at the conventions, but it, it it is a lot of effort to to develop and put together convention classes. I mean, I'm, right. I'm I honestly I'm getting it gets very old to beg models. And, yes, and for classes, you know, you're you're begging models from a lot of vendors and stuff like that, and that becomes exhausting. Um, prepping models, building armatures. Uh, <laughs> Trev, Trev, if you're out there and you're watching this, dude, you are a lifesaver. He he did all of my armatures for Gen Con. Um, 36 armatures. My God. Yeah. Uh, you know, last year at Adepticon, we um we went through over 300 models <laughs> through all the classes that we taught. And you have to build those. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I went through this prepping for Gen Con here like last week. Right. And it's, yeah, it's a thing. Yeah. Um, so, so we're going to, we're going to shrink back a little bit on, on the conventions, um, concentrate a little more on the, on the classes. Um, definitely going to concentrate a lot more on developing you guys. Uh, we want to get you guys out there and get you guys doing a bit more. Uh, in fact, We'll talk off air on that one. Sure, sure, of course. Uh, yeah, um, we want to start planning the next season. Right on. So. And then uh, last question. Uh, JV says, is there a particular video on YouTube that you'd recommend for painters trying to improve their skills? I'll broaden that question to say, like, is there a channel you like or anything like that? Something that you see out there or that you've seen shared out there that you think's good? My, my go-to and who I always tell everybody to go to is Hobby Chief. <laughs> you have this library of every technique. I go look at it. I, man, I'm, I'm going to paint some black and I kind of know how I'm going to paint it, but I'm going to go over and just take a look at what Vince is doing and see if there's an idea or something that I'm missing or maybe change something or adjust something. And you have a video on everything. I can't think of, of a single topic that I can't type in and you've already done a video on it. So, um, do I, Yet yeah. somehow I keep finding more every week. Uh, yeah, no, we've got a big fun one for 200 coming up. So yeah. that'll be a that'll be a fun one. Since we're actually hitting the 200 milestone, I wanted to do something really fun and unusual. So I think that'll yeah. be a good one. And, and you know, I mean, I, I don't want to discredit some of the other artists out there. There's a lot of artists out there. There's a lot of them teaching a lot of stuff. Um, some of it's good. Some of it's bad. Some of it's terrible. Uh, you definitely got to wade through it. Uh, but the nice thing is, is that you're very consistent. You're very consistent. Um, everything you do really breaks it down to the basics. I, I, you don't do that that magic technique where... Right, sure. You, you know, where they're like, okay, so we're going to take this pan and we're going to put these potatoes in it. And well, now... <laughs> we're down oh, to- casserole. Oh, we have a finished casserole. You know, you don't do that. Uh, the other thing that you don't do, which we see a lot, and, um, you know... Uh, I always think back to uh, years ago, there was a video that came out, non-metallic metals, uh, fantastic video. Um, the only issue was, is that the in, the person that shot the video that, that did it, it was a monkey see, monkey do type video where sure. it was like, okay, you're gonna put this light here. This is the colors I'm mixing. And he had a camera of his palette and he had a camera of the model and he went through and he was like, now I'm gonna take this white here and I'm gonna put this white here and I'm gonna take this ochre here and I'm gonna put it here. And for about a month after that video, there were all of these fantastic Sigmarites. Oh, they were gorgeous. And they were all the Sigmarite that came in the White Dwarf magazine. Right. The same one. And then you saw a couple artists branch off of that and try to do the same techniques on, it was still a Sigmarite, but it was a different pose. And very few of them had the results that they had with that original mini. 
the reason being is, is that the artist that was teaching it was saying, paint here, paint here, paint here. Not, this is why we're painting here. This is how we're doing this. This is the reasoning behind it. This is the technique that we're using. This is why we chose this technique here and we didn't do it here and stuff like that. That's what your videos do. Your, your videos break down the, the whys and the hows. And that's super important for teaching um, because the, uh, it's that whole adage of, Give a man a fish to, you know, feed. You're him. right. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm definitely into the teaching people how to fish. Right. I You're agree. Definitely yeah. Teaching how to fish. And uh, that's big. So uh, yeah, any, anytime that I'm going to recommend a video, it's my first answer is, Hey, go over to hobby cheats and check out, just, just search it. I'm sure he's got something there. <laughs> One of these days I'll organize that playlist better. So there's like in sort of silos in there. I keep saying I'm going to do it. I threaten to do it. And then I just get caught up in working on actual models instead. Curses, yeah. curses my addiction to this painting. All right. Well, Caleb, buddy, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. I really, really thank you for sitting down with us. Awesome. I, I had a great time. Thank you for having me on. Um, if you guys haven't gotten a chance yet, make sure that you get over to Nova. Um, uh, buy your raffle tickets. Um, there's so many things out there. Check out the Night Lords I did. Uh, new technique for lightning I tried using the airbrush for almost all of it. I almost accomplished airbrushing all the lightning. Um, that close. But, that close. Yeah. Um, so check out the Night Lords. Check out all the armies out there. Definitely get your at least $8. You know what? It only takes one ticket to win. That's and, right. Yeah, you know, you know your percentage chance of winning that that warlord if you don't buy a ticket, it's zero. But it's like the lottery. If you buy at least one, you're in. And right. and as you said, like you who doesn't want an eight thousand dollar Titan for eight dollars? It's the greatest discount in the history of discounts. You you talk about twenty percent off at some retailer, pshaw. <laughs> okay, this is this is a point one percent sale. It's incredible. And then uh, also, if you guys get a chance, join CK Studios. We'll be coming to town near you. Um, watch for Vince. We're going to have Vince. We're going to bury Vince. So. <laughs> I'll be out there. We'll all be out there. The link's down in the description where you can see all of the... I'll put the Nova down there. I'll put the link to the miniature that uh, that Caleb shared earlier. Uh, and I'll put the link, of course, to the uh, charity raffle. So uh, go check all that out. Caleb, thank you again, sir. For all of you who are watching, thank you very much. More interviews to come. I appreciate this. Everybody uh, joining us for this late night over here on the East Coast, at least. Uh, interview after dark. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. After hours with CK. <laughs>